Good morning and aloha and welcome back, especially a special welcome to those of us joining on this really monumental day for the Winter Clinical Conference. For those of you who were here this morning, you know we had our first half of our live stream event and this is just absolutely exciting for not only those of you in the audience, but as well as those of you joining us online from far reaches of the country, from different time zones, all the way from the East Coast to the Pacific for this really monumental inaugural live stream event. And for those of you who were here this morning, you know that this is the first time this has actually been done at a major dermatology conference. So this is really exciting. We're all part of history here today. And we really need to thank Dr. Regal, Dr. Lebwell, and Dr. Del Rosso for kind of keeping us ahead of the curve in terms of technology when it comes to dermatology education. I think this is a fantastic way for our colleagues who couldn't make it for whatever reason to still be a part of all the excitement we're here for today. I'm Samal Desai. I'm going to be chairing the next session this morning. It's a pleasure to introduce our first panel, chaired by Dr. Regal, clinical professor of dermatology at NYU, Dr. Adelaide Abair, who's a professor of dermatology at UT Houston and a pediatric dermatologist, Dr. Stephen Wang from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New Jersey, and Josh Zeichner, director of cosmetical and clinical research at Mount Sinai, to really talk about an exciting discussion in how to motivate our patients to use sunscreen. And I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Regal. Well, thank you very much, Samal, and it's certainly a pleasure to be here and talk about a topic that's particularly appropriate while we're here in a very uh, UV intense area, I would say, to do this. We're going to be speaking today with you and give our views on some issues related to sun protection and really the importance of achieving behavioral change. And that's what our panel is going to focus on today about ways we can motivate our patients to be more sun protective. Um, by way of disclosures, all the panelists have consulted with Neutrogena on this presentation. So let's begin. This is the current melanoma data that just came out this past week from the American Cancer Society for 2018. And what's really interesting with this data is that we see that the incidence of melanoma, the number of cases, has continued to rise, but the mortality rate, the number of deaths from melanoma, has actually fallen now for the second year in a row. And why that's important is that the incidence of melanoma is related to behavior, protecting yourself from the sun, wearing sunscreen, wearing protective clothing, behavioral things. The death rate for melanoma is what we call secondary prevention. That's basically if you have a spot, see your dermatologist early, get it detected early before it's advanced. So what this data suggests to me is that our efforts in secondary prevention and early detection are actually more effective right now than our efforts in primary prevention, and therefore we're not doing what we need to do with behavioral changes to really make a difference. So that's what I see from this data. And this is a paper that just came out of the BJD last month, which I thought was very interesting. They did a calculation, and they determined if we could raise the sunscreen usage in the U.S. 5% a year, for 10 years, so 5% annually for 10 years, how many invasive melanomas between now and 2031 could be averted? And it turns out by their calculations, which are very conservative, 230,000 additional melanomas would be averted in that period of time, just by getting 5% more people a year to use sunscreen, which is a pretty, pretty profound number. Despite the science that's out there, Sunscreen compliance is low. Here's a study showing only 30% of men and 15, 30% of women, excuse me, and 15% of men regularly use sunscreen on their face and exposed skin. And in fact, less than 40% of American households actually buy sunscreen. And despite that, consumers know that sunscreens are important. Nine out of 10 Americans believe that sunscreen is important for protecting a child's health. But more than four out of five parents, they, their, sunscreen, their children don't wear sunscreen on a regular basis. So again, there's that disconnect between the information and the behavior to make a difference. So we're going to talk about today a little bit about the case potentially for a new behavioral approach. And there's a bunch of strategies and motivators that have been out there. Certainly uh, studies showing that if you put uh, the sunscreen next to your water bottle, that would remind you to use it outdoors. Uh, the classic one, put it next to your toothpaste in the morning so you brush your teeth and in fact uh, you remember to use your sunscreen. Um, people will use sunscreen if they believe it works, they believe their friends use it, that's another one of the things. And certainly social media has really not been used very effectively to really amplify the message yet. So we're going to have a panel talking about a couple of questions, how we might be able to change that. And of course they've been introduced before, but certainly I'm happy to have Bita Abair, Josh Zeichner, and Steve Wong with us today. And, uh, 
we're all going to give our views on what, how we tell patients things and what we're going to do, and we'll tee it up with a couple of questions. And the, the first question I want to pose to the group is, patients tell us all the time reasons I can't use sunscreen for this or I can't use sunscreen for that. So when patients come up with these questions and give you these barriers, how do you overcome them? Uh, what are the ways you would get your patients to really uh, start using sunscreen again? And I'll open up to any of you. Well, I know I treat many children who have atopic dermatitis, and their tolerance to sunscreen is sometimes a real barrier to effective use or even use at all. I have found that the sunscreens that contain only titanium dioxide or zinc oxide are far more well tolerated by that population group. And I advise parents to buy those particular um, ingredients so that the child will be able to tolerate. And I think that overcomes a significant barrier. We know those children's skin is more delicate, but it, it really warrants the same protection that any child's skin would get. Well, I think you're right, and certainly not just for kids, but cosmetic elegance is important. And, you know, I would say the, the best sunscreen is the one people are going to use, right? Absolutely. And if it's gooky or sticky or whatever, they're just not going to do it. Steve? I mean, I think we have a lot of barriers. We talked about the cosmetic element of it, um, but there are some of the barriers that's completely overlooked, right? You're looking at uh, the packaging size, and the uh, average size is about 4.0 ounce and uh, 4 ounce. So we know that we have to use about 1.4 ounce for covering the average adult size. So if somehow the manufacturer can increase the size, and you would you somehow put in the mind of the individuals, they will use more. You will use more, you will get more protection. Um, also, I think the idea of uh, the biggest barrier that's something we don't talk about, that is, uh, this, it's, it's not a habit. It's not in everyone's routine. And um, one of the things I thought about is, you know, um, thinking about this, uh, a Dale Green study from um, uh, Australia, they showed it's a daily use of sunscreen with SPF 16 that protected against squamous cell and melanoma. Right? If you look at their sunscreen they were using, uh, it's not very great sunscreen because it's SPF 16 and also they didn't have really good UVA protection. But in my mind, I think another element to this is that they got individual to use the sunscreen every day, right? And at the same time, this sets off the first um, sort of a domino reaction and get them to act. And they start avoiding the sun, they put on the hat, and they're doing a whole bunch of sequence of action after 10 years, and they made a difference, right? So I think we need to think in that context, and how do we get people to change, how do we build that habit, right? That's why we did the study looking at um, putting the sunscreen right next to the toothpaste, and just in six weeks, in the dead winter, you can increase sunscreen use by 20%. Well, that's great. Josh, what do your patients say? What are the reasons they tell you they don't want to use sunscreen? So I think my favorite excuse, and I'm sure all of you guys get this too, is I'm not out in the sun. So then I say, well, how did you get here today? You know? So we know that incidental sunlight, even low levels, add up over a lifetime. And I think we just need to really dispel these misconceptions and make sure that patients understand that you know, even driving in their car, you can get um, UV light exposure. It penetrates right through window glass. You know, getting in and out of the subway, in and out of the car, it really adds up and, and make sure that they know that, you know, you visited me, you know, not in a bubble today. You got to my office somehow, so you were exposed to the sun. Do that. Okay, well, let's look at our next question. And, you know, patients, they're going to go out in the sun. We can't tell, I was kid by patients that uh, I say you can't be a vampire and only come out at night. We don't expect that. I think they think dermatologists suggest that. But they have to do it logically and come with common sense. So. How do you discuss this with your patients to give a good balance between the benefits of being outdoors with the benefits, certainly, of protection? Well, I'll start. I know there's some early evidence that even suggests for young children, if they go out in the sun, they have better ocular development and they have perhaps less, less nearsightedness. That's a new phenomenon. So I really do encourage that, that there be outdoor activity. We don't want children being obese. We don't want children who don't play and, and develop activities and sports and hobbies that about allow them to lead an active lifestyle. But we do want to educate them about photoprotection. And I think going through what they like and don't like about a sunscreen can be, be very helpful. I do talk to them about how to apply the sunscreen effectively. And if they're worried about it running in their eyes, we might use a stick uh, down to the eye level and then use perhaps another formulation of sunscreen in other body parts so that tolerance is very good. Also the stick formulations are very good on lips, reapplication for noses, 
and on the ears. That really can just smooth over some of the challenges that they have perceived prior to the visit they, that they've had with me in the office. Steve? Um, and I think one of the things is I think we need to um, downplay the anxiety that people have. You know, I'm, I work in the skin cancer uh, center and everyone coming in is absolutely scared. And I try to sort of mitigate their anxiety level. And I explain to them, you know, go out and enjoy the sun, exactly for all the benefit we just talked about. But do so in a responsible and moderate uh, fashion. And that's the key. Because if we tell people don't go out of the sun, that's not a possible, right? So no one's going to do it. So they may sort of leave your office, practice that for a week, but it's not going to be a habit that can be built. So three months later, they're going to go back to the old state, right? And the thing is, I focus on the mother. I mean, I think uh, in any family unit, it's the mother that's the most instrumental. It, the, the, the woman of the family that will tell the husband what to do, and they're the ones that's going to put on the sunscreen for the kids, right? And, but the thing is, now I tell my uh, female patients that is, put on the sunscreen yourself first. Because what happened is, uh, if you just run around on the beach, put the sunscreen on your kids, you are getting sun exposure for the first 20 minutes, right? But if you put on the sunscreen yourself, you set an example for the kids, and the kids will basically model you, right? And that's how the kids learn from everything else. They model our own behavior. So that's some of the message, some of the changes I've been doing. Josh? Yeah, so, so I agree with everything that you guys said. I think um, one of the biggest motivating factors that we have is resorting to patients' vanity. And there's a lot of data out there, especially in young women, saying that if you put sunscreen on, you will prevent the development of wrinkles. Now listen, whether they get wrinkles or not, that's a totally separate issue. We really care about skin cancers, particularly melanoma. But especially in that younger group who may be at more at risk, that college student who's finally on her own and making her own decisions, perhaps they're responsible ones, perhaps they're not responsible ones, resorting, I think, to vanity, um, is actually very, very useful in many cases. Well, they have to be able to relate to the message. I think yeah. that's key. Uh, the Academy did a PSA about a dozen years or so ago, which had the stat, one in five Americans will get a skin cancer, will you be the one? And they had five teenagers walking down the street and one kind of looking over his shoulder and implying he was the one. So it was a great ad, but they kind of focus tested it afterwards. And when they showed this to teenagers, it didn't work because every teenager knew that they would not be the one. It would be one of the other four that would be the one. So again, the message has to connect with that. I think it's important. Okay, let's go to our next question. And this has to do with higher SPF products and why they work. And we have a paper that just got accepted. It's online in Jan. It'll be in the May issue. And we did a study, a split-face, double-blind study comparing SPF 50 and SPF 100 sunscreen. I alluded to that earlier in the meeting. And what we found was on the SPF 50 side of the face, you were 10 times more likely to be sunburned than the SPF 100. A lot of other parameters we checked, we weighed the tubes, there was no difference in usage or reapplications or whatever, or skin types. So clearly there's some benefit to the higher SPF. So what do you think about that? Joe? we'll start make yours as well this way this time and uh, see what sure. you think. So I have a line that I use with all of my patients. A higher SPF product is like an insurance policy to make sure that you get the best quality of protection for the longest period of time. We know that patients, you know, even myself, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. We're not putting on as much as we should be applying, and we're certainly not reapplying as much as we, sh we should. So starting off at a higher level, um, again, will give you that best protection for the longest period of time. Steve? And I'm you're absolutely right, right? That um, a study has shown that the real SPF protection you're getting is only about one-third, one-half the labeled SPF. So if you bought a product that has SPF 30, you're really getting SPF 10, all right? Um, and there, in my mind, there are different types of sunscreen. There's you know, daily use for, you know, in New York City in the winter versus you coming to Hawaii. And SPF 30, uh, I would say even 50, when you come to Hawaii, it's just not going to do the job, and you will get burned. And also there's something else that we don't talk about, and we always think about SPF is thinking about UVB protection. And there's also another element of the UVA protection. Once you increase the SPF, and the UVA protection will also go up, because you know, nowadays the sunscreen have to pass the critical wavelength test, and the critical wavelength test uh, is tied in directly to the SPF measurement. 
Peter? And I feel that because children are the ones who probably get the most sun exposure. I live in Texas, they all live in New York, so it's a little different uh, amount of light that we have. We have uh, four seasons, you know, basically sunshine pretty much all year, all year round, and it's warm, and people do spend a great deal of time outside, but because we know so much of the sun damage occurs in the very earliest years of life, I really want to emphasize high SPF use for all the reasons my colleagues have mentioned, but mostly because I think people don't apply enough, so we want to ensure that they get the best amount of protection that we can possibly allow them to have, and a higher SPF does that for us. All right, well that kind of uh, tees up the next question perfectly because we think of uh, the universe of patients that we have, but there are special subset populations that we really have to I think focus our message on to really get it to be effective. And so, excuse me, and certainly the first group would be the pediatric group. So maybe you want to comment on that. One of the things I like to emphasize is it's not just my Fitzpatrick one through three group that I'm talking about sunscreens to. It's all children, regardless of their Fitzpatrick skin type, because the, the sun in, in Texas is very intense and our dark skin patients can get sunburns just as much uh, if they stay out long enough is our more fair-skinned patients. So we want those children to get protection as well. I also treat patients who have rosacea. These are older patients. And we know that sometimes if they wear a chemical sunscreen, which allows absorption of the light, they'll feel that their rosacea is flaring or that their skin feels more warm. So in that population, I'll suggest that they use a titanium or zinc oxide reflective type sunscreen. And they often tolerate that and like it a lot more because of the cosmetic impact. Steve? Um, I think it's, uh, we sort of touched upon that a little bit. Uh, I think when we tell a patient a message, uh, the message has to resonate with that individual. And I think a lot of times that we are just creatures of habits, and we don't make decisions based on rational thoughts, right? And you have to say something that uh, touch upon the fear and dreams and hope of the individual in front of you. And hard to do that for a kid, but no, hard to do that for a kid. Kid is uh, uh, it's not that hard. <laughs> but um, um, they have, they have many fears. They have more hope. So the, the the individuals population I deal with a lot is uh, elderly individuals with skin cancer. And one subgroup is the elderly man. They are about let's say 70 years old. You just did three mo surgery over the last year, and you told them about skin cancer prevention, and they nod. They say yes, yes. But six months later, they came back completely burned. I mean, like. Mm -hmm. You ask him, like, don't you remember what we did to you? And the guy goes, yeah, but, you know, it wasn't that bad. I have you, right? So then I looked over, uh, I looked over to the wife and sitting there, and she just shakes her head. And so at this moment, like, it doesn't matter what I say because the guy is not going to listen because the wife's been married for 40 years has not made an impact, and I, I certainly cannot make an impact, right? Yeah. And so what I do is, um, so I turn around, I turn around, I say, do you have any grandkids? And he goes, yes. I said, do you really, can you just please set a good example for your grandkids, right? And I don't care what you do, but when you are with your grandkids, please wear a hat and closing your sunscreen because uh, you don't want them to develop a skin cancer when they're turning 30, right? So, what I'm doing there is trying to use guilt, right? <laughs> so, and uh, you have to use some sort of mechanism, some sort of message that resonates with that individual, right? And that's uh, my message. My take. Well, that's, that's always hard. I mean, I have a couple of patients who basically says their job is to enjoy themselves in the sun and yes. grow skin tantrums, and yes. my job is to get rid of them yes. so they don't die, right? Yes. So, yes. very simple relationship that yes. we have. But it's, it's very hard to reach that group. I mean, they're, they're, everything you say is, is very true. Josh. Yeah, so I, I agree with Steve. I think it's about tailoring the message specifically to the group that you're dealing with. So when you're speaking about men, you want to incorporate sunscreen into the daily routine. So what does the man do almost every day? They shave. And what are you doing after shaving? You're applying an aftershave lotion. So why can't that aftershave lotion be a moisturizer with SPF? So tying that into what they're doing. If you're talking about darker skinned individuals, the big concern is whiteness or ashiness of the skin and being able to give specific recommendations for products that fully absorb. Um, and then you can, you can you know, tailor your recommendations depending on the particular group that you have so that you know, that particular person can easily incorporate it into his or her daily routine. I'd just like to add that you, know, um, you can sort of play this dynamic relationship between the family members sitting in the room, right? And I mentioned if the wife is sitting there, and uh, women, I think, by far are more compliant.
client, number one, and number two, there's uh, most of the time sort of quote unquote nag the husband, right? So what I do is I just encourage that behavior. My wife behavior. never nags me. Uh, never. And I, I just She's basically wonderful. encourage She's that behavior. Says keep reminding him, and I turn to the husband and says, listen to your wife, you will be a happier man. But so uh, that's another tip. <laughs> And especially, especially with families, you know, the moms and the dads are very good at applying the sunscreen on the kids, but, you know, explain to them that they have a responsibility not only to take care of their children, but to take care of themselves so yeah. that they're healthy for the future, and, and to use the same rules that they, you know, have for their kids for themselves. Um, frequently at the beach, you know, what I do myself with my kids and my family is I set a timer on my, my telephone. So every two hours it beeps because otherwise you get really distracted. And that's another tip that you can give, you know, for busy families. That's a great idea. In fact, there's some other, those uh, color changing devices, those yeah. wristbands yeah. and stuff, which are sort of qualitative, but also remind people to do that too. Um, I guess two other subgroups I think are important. One is people who have already had skin cancer. There's this data out there, several studies that show when you're diagnosed for the first year, you're more, you take more photoprotective measures. Yep. By one year out, you're back where you are, and by two years, you're almost below where you were before you were diagnosed. So how do you motivate them to continue to motivate them to have that behavioral change that they start off with, but they lose? Sure, so listen, the glass may be 80% full, which represents your cumulative lifetime exposure to sun, but you don't want the glass to overflow. So we can't undo what's been done, but you certainly can prevent adding more water to the glass. And I think there's another group that uh, um, people with transplants, kidney transplant, yes. cardiac yep. transplant, those are really high risk individuals. Uh -huh. And I find those group of patients are very motivated. And what I try to do is, you know, um, I try to make them feel better because and I try to explain to them, you know, um, part of the disease mechanism is due to their immune suppression, right? And, um, and but getting back to you to talking about how do you motivate the other group, I, I really think there's a kind of a, a disconnect between knowledge and behavior, right? And um, and this, this gap in the middle, and sometimes you know you can rationalize all you want, you can motivate them all that you want, but the traditional motivation triggers is not going to cut it. I think it, you have to impact their surrounding environment, and you have to create this entire chain of sequence of action, and you get them to knock down the first act, the step. The first step could be very simple, minimal, and once you do that, it triggers the entire reaction, and that's what we have to think about. And I think one of the challenges we have, too, is that the other side, we'll call them the dark side, uh, literally, uh, they, uh, they have an easy sound bite. They can say, it feels good to lie in the sun, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I don't care. We, we can't respond to the sound bite. I've always thought about how to do that, but we, it's a complex response. You can't just put it in one sound bite to do it. I think that, that's one of the challenges we face. And the other special population I wanted to touch on was adolescents. So I'm going to get your views on this media because you deal with them a lot. Right. I generally, one of the things I actually do is I ask my young patients, how old do you think I am? I get a really broad range of answers, but um, usually it's pretty good. Uh, anything under 40, uh, golden. That's my patient forever. I will always love them and care for them. Um, but I often show them my hands. I don't have any lenigos on the back of my hands. Sometimes I compare my, the back of my hand to the mother's hand or the grandmother's hand, whoever has brought them in. And I'll say, what do you think made this difference? And the difference is that I've worn sunscreens since my 20s. I wasn't just studying in the library, although I did a lot of that too. I was actually putting sunscreen on. And I think, again, appealing to these adolescents, especially the girls, it's harder for the boys, uh, telling them by wearing a sunscreen every day, they will have less wrinkles. They'll need me less as they grow up, at least from the cosmetic aspect. For the boys, I ask, what, who is the team sport individual that you really admire? When did you last see them on television or in a magazine? How did their skin look? Don't you think they take care of their skin? Don't you want to, when you become the athlete of the year, want to look good when you're represented publicly just like they are? Of course, every kid thinks that that's exactly what will happen. And we just try to encourage them somewhat from a vanity standpoint, but whatever works, if that's what gets them to use the sunscreen, I think we just have to empower them to do it. Steve? Um, for adolescents, I think it's a really challenging, and I think you're dealing with a uh, segment of the population during that age, they're completely fearless, right? And uh, they're thinking about, uh, they're not thinking about mortality, they're not thinking about melanoma, they're not thinking about any of this stuff. And the peer pressure 
the prom, the boyfriend, and uh, their Facebook likes, that's what's occupying their mindset, right? Um, and um, I, um, you know, again, Josh talked about appealing to uh, the age and uh, the appearance for the female and for the young girls. And I think, I think the opportunity really lies in how do we leverage technology, how do we leverage Instagram, how do we leverage Facebook and, and to change behavior, right? And I think one of the interesting thing is we always talk about um, number of percentage of people don't use sunscreen, number of percentage of people don't use photo protection. And I think we, perhaps we should talk about the other side, that is X percentage of people do use the product. Because one of the example I thought was really interesting is during the 80s and uh, there's a campaign about just say no for, drug, for, for, uh, for not taking drugs. And they show a lot of the public ad, et cetera. But what was interesting was it's a very um, well received, but then you look at the use of your drug, it's just increased. And then one of the potential side effects is you're telling people don't use drug everything else, and you got a whole bunch of teenagers sitting in the back and thinking, oh my God, either what is this drug? And then now they made it like noticed, right? Um, so likewise, I think if you tell people, you know, uh, less than 30% of people use sunscreen, um, but then they think this is the norm. The norm is don't use sunscreen, right? If we somehow tell people that, uh, like, you know, sunscreen is used at least once a day or something like this, and then people think this is accepted behavior, maybe that will shift. That's an interesting point, interesting way to review it and reverse yeah. it in a sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I think it's an idea of uh, we want to, I mean, I think in the adolescent state and the people uh, follow peer pressure, they want to follow what other people are doing. If the normal quote unquote state is no one uses sunscreen, so then I better belong in this don't use group. But if somehow we tell people X percentage of people, you'd be surprised that many people are actually using sun protection, maybe somehow we can shift behavior. And again, I think a lot of times we have to tap into the psychology, uh, looking into how psychology is being used for anti-smoking, uh, other kind of um, public campaign because sometimes we think there is something that's very logical, rational, you may backfire. Josh? I think um, getting the patients that I see in the office to use sunscreen is the easy part because who are these adolescents? It's our acne patients and, and we can discuss with them sun sensitivity from acne medications and the need for moisturizers. Um, I think the big issue is, is more what, what Steve is talking about here, it's, it's, it's changing behaviors in the public because the overwhelming majority of adolescents are not being seen in our office and, and um, you know, camp, social media campaigns um, I, I think would be really useful, um, you know, high profile individuals and celebrities um, sending a positive message I think in some ways is what may be needed to affect um, change. You know, it is interesting because there was a shift about a decade ago towards advertising with, with, with having people with uh, less tan, let's call it. And I think it went back the other way a little bit. So maybe we can influence that to some extent as dermatologists and uh, through the academy and other groups that really work on yeah. doing this. All right, we'll go to our next question, which I think is the fun one. And I've asked each of you to come up with one tip that you think is most effective and motivate your patients to be sun safe and protect themselves. So what do you, a patient who is like uh, totally recalcitrant, and uh, what's the tip? I'll start with you, Josh. You know, I came up with all my like one-liners already. Um, <laughs> let me think. Um, I think the point is that, that patients should be, um, you know, sun safe in general, and sunscreen is just one part of, of sun protective behavior. And, and I think that's what we need to educate our patients on. It's okay to go out in the sun. It's okay to enjoy yourself. So you just have to do it in a smart way. And we all know about trying to avoid sun during peak hours, sun protective clothing, hats, glasses, and of course, sunscreen. And then I think I'm all out of my other fun, no, you're motivating great. ideas. <laughs> Steve? So um, I, I sort of tried to have a dialogue, right? I said, I understand you're not going to listen to me. <laughs> but once you set the expectation like low, all my patients, right? um, once you set the expectation low, you may surprise yourself with the success. Um, so I say, listen, do me a favor. You know, uh, can you please just use a sunscreen every morning uh, after you're brushing your teeth before you're leaving your bathroom? Just do it for me for 60 days. Right? I, I tell you why I do this. Because one is I want to create a habit. Right? I, I keep talking about this habit. Right? And um, uh, the idea is you want to put individual into a right context, 
where they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, and in what context are they going to do it, and follow what other triggers are they going to do it, right? So you tell them in the morning, and you tell them after they brush the teeth, you tell them before they leave the bathroom, so you basically lock them up basically in this environment. That is, you can't leave the bathroom until you put this down, right? And you tell them to do it for 60 days, because uh, in some of the behavior of biological uh, psychology study, they've shown that the average time it takes to get someone to create a new habit is 60, 60 days, all right? And the idea here is that we as a human beings are creatures of habit that we don't have the discipline or the willpower to change behavior. And that's why diet fails, that's why we cannot stop smoking, and that's why we cannot go exercise, right? So you tell them that basically do 60 days so that we basically you create this action, create enough discipline, get them to create this first habit, right? So they're going to use the sunscreen, hopefully, and I told them, I said, can you promise me you're going to do that? They, they probably say, yes, okay, <laughs> then, then they go, right? The whole idea is, if I get them to do that for that 60 days, chances are they created this habit, chances are they're going to go out and start thinking about the interaction with the sun, and this is the same idea I mentioned earlier about a Dale Green study where SPF 16, poor, bad UVA protection, after 10 years, reduced skin cancer. Dramatically, and melanoma risk was reduced in half. 50%. And, yep. and basal melanoma risk was reduced 75%. Yep. So it was actually, a, this was done in Australia, a very dramatic study. Vita? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think I set the stage to tell parents when I'm dealing with their children and educating them about sunscreen use is that most parents are not aware that it's the earliest years of life that allow the greatest cumulative accumulation of photo damage, and that they may not see the effect for many years down the line. I often use the dental model too. You go see the dentist twice a year, so you have a lifelong history of healthy teeth. It's not because you necessarily have disease. My goal is not to have to bring you bad news that you have a precancer or a skin cancer. My job is to help prevent it. But I really want to talk to the parents that these early years are the most impactful years. And again, learning that habit, just like learning to brush your teeth, go to the dentist, wear a seatbelt, all of those are habits that indeed we teach as parents to our children. So I try to go over that and reiterate it as much as I can on every visit. And I think we have wonderful opportunities, even if they don't listen, I still think we have the obligation to discuss the importance of sunscreen use, especially at an early age for the patients that we serve. So I think my biggest success is when I try to figure out a way to at least get a balance with the patient because we were alluded to this earlier, you can't force people not to go outside. You can say, I refuse to lock you, I'll lock you in, I'll never leave you out. People are not going to do that. So I say you can go outside, healthy behavior is good, exercise is good, um, but basically do a balance. Don't lie on the beach and bake for baking's sake. You know, at least get some benefit out of your time outdoors. And also, there's no downside to lowering your risk for these other bad things while you're doing things outdoors, like wearing sunscreen and protect yourself. The other challenging group, I think, is the adolescents. And I know the academies tried this a number of ways, and many other groups have tried it. The only message I think that partially has worked for me is telling a teenager when you're 30, you're going to look 50. Because 30 is a curse already when you're a teenager, right? <laughs> And you can look 50, my God, you know, that's, that's awful. But that sometimes reaches them a little bit, the wrinkle, the wrinkle which with it. So, and you know, Darryl, the, the, the only other tip that, that has actually worked in my practice is accountability. You know, if you make sure that patients are accountable for their actions by making them come back into the office, maybe a little bit earlier than you would otherwise, that really helps. So during the summer, that older guy with the sun damage, you know, if I want to see him back in three or four weeks, then just like going to the dentist, you're going to floss before the same thing in terms of your sunscreen coming back into the dermatologist's office. So we're going to stop at this point and really review, and I think the message is it's time for all of us to be champions for skin health, because compliance really is, we're forcing it on our patients, it's important, and we have to think about, as we heard the messages today that our patients need to work on, we can't forget about those special populations that we alluded to to really uh, customize the message, and especially for parents, I think it's important to make sure that they protect their children. We showed you that data from the BJD study that basically showed if you protected the children early, you got even a bigger uh, hit in terms of long-term uh, preventative measures. So with that, I want to thank our panel. I hope you've enjoyed the, the session, and we'll move on to the next panel. Thank you very much.